When you're flying in a multiplayer server where the tanks are deployed in a straight line down a road, you can use a JU-88, PE-2, and A-20B to take them out with a specialized technique that is proven to be quite effective if you follow a few basic rules. This is the first Ground Attacker Handbook video, and I chose this section to be first because, frankly, I have a shitload of tank killing footage, and while the handbook is written in a semi-formal style, these videos will be narrated in 100% American GI vernacular, which I speak fucking fluently. So let's get started. Now I stumbled onto this technique back in 2016, made a video about it, and it has gradually caught on over the past few years. Back then I couldn't help but notice that even a big 500 kilogram bomb had to be dropped pretty close to a tank to kill it, especially when we're talking T-34s or KV-1s. You might get lucky and put every bomb down close enough to kill a tank, or you might kick up a lot of dirt but not have much to show for it. The reality is that most of that big bomb weight is wasted in a blast area going out and away from the column. A string of smaller bombs falling within the column area funnels much more total bomb weight and blast into the column. Now obviously accuracy and vehicle spacing are critical to the effectiveness of this technique, but along a linear target like a tank column, provided you put the bombs down within the column, several smaller bombs are more effective than a few big bombs. Now all that being said, there are wind situations where large bombs may be more preferable to small bombs, or sometimes you might want to bring both, and we'll cover that a little later. Now these aircraft can generally destroy many more tanks than one of these medium bombers in a single mission unless you are very good at dropping single bombs accurately out of medium bombers, in which case you can take out a whole tank column by yourself, but this approach requires multiple passes, and quite a few actually. And before you get started on all those tanks, you're going to have to do something about all those fucking flat guns in the column or you are going to get shot to shit, and you're going to have to ensure the enemy fighter threat in the area is neutralized. Now that takes some numbers, and if you don't have them, the odds of pulling that off and living to tell the tank are not on your side. The alternative approach is a one pass and gone run in a medium bomber. While this approach is certainly not risk free, it's considerably less risky than a multiple pass approach with inadequate resources to address flak and enemy fighters, and with some practice, you can achieve decent results. The better planned you are prior to takeoff, the better your chances of success. When you look at that target icon on the map, you need to know how to read the tea leaves to understand the column direction and be able to determine how it's going to be aligned on the road. Know how long the columns are for the server you're in. If the map's been going on for quite a while, get on the chat and find out the column flak situation and how hard the column has been hit already. There's a decent chance it's already thrashed and there's only a couple of vehicles left. If you're leading a flight group against a column, make sure you assign target sections of the column to each pilot, like a front, middle, back kind of thing, and you can further specify target assignments depending on how large your group is. When the column runs along a twisting road, and most of the time it will, multiple aircraft means multiple attack dive directions, and your group should make an effort to get into position and synchronize your attack dive so that you're not pulling the flak onto each other. Now, like I said before, this technique is being used a lot these days, but I see people doing it wrong and fucking it up all the time. There are two cardinal rules you should follow, and the first one is, always attack the column from the rear. This is important because the default facing of most flat guns and tank columns is to the front, and when you attack from the front, you are flying straight into the proverbial lion's mouth, and making it extremely easy for them to activate, move the barrel up about a meter, and immediately tear you a new asshole on the attack dive, just like this dude here that I happened to catch on video a few months ago in the TAW server who made an okay run, I guess, but got shot up and lost his aircraft. Take the extra time to come around from the back, so the flat guns have to traverse 180 degrees to get a shot at you, and if you execute your attack dive at high speed, they normally won't get a crack at you until you're on the way out. And by the way, this fucker here has just made its debut, and depending on how many of these make their way into multiplayer server columns, I predict a tsunami of butthurt for red ground attackers hitting blue tank columns from the front. If you're flying a JU-88 against red columns, you have the additional problem with the GAZ M4 quad machine guns that have a default facing to the rear. They're not as dangerous as the front facing ZIS 572s, but if you get two or three of them firing at you, they can mess you up good. The only capability you have at your disposal to mitigate this threat, outside of a dedicated flak dragger, is speed.
When you're flying a multiplayer server, it's important to know that server. The flat gun types, numbers, and placement, and most importantly, how they react. I'm talking specifically about activation distance. The farther the activation distance, the more time they have to track you and shoot you down. When you know what you're up against, you know how fast you need to dive to reach a speed that will enable you to make it over the column and get your bombs out before the sky is filled with AAA tracers. Once you know the magic number for attack dive speed, you need to determine how much altitude you need to achieve that speed. You can max out your engines and close the radiators during the attack dive to reduce that required altitude. Just make sure to reset everything on egress before they get damaged. And finally, you need to know your aircraft's dive speed limit so you're not losing pieces off it on the attack dive. When you're turning on to the rear of the column to begin your attack dive, the best thing you can do to set yourself up for success is to be lined up with the column before commencing your dive. In a best case scenario, you're turning in 90 degrees off the target area, keeping the target area in sight, and completing your turn so that you're lined up nice and straight. But multiplayer situations are rarely best case, and you may be turning in for 45 degrees or 130 or even 180 degrees depending on the situation. Be that as it may, the pre-dive turn onto target is just as important as the attack dive itself. And if you start the dive off to one side or pointing off to the wrong angle, you're going to be all fucked up on the way down and fighting to get lined up straight. And as the aircraft picks up speed and the controls stiffen, it doesn't get easier. And the end result is probably going to be something shitty like this guy's run. Ideally, you're turning onto the column from an attack point two or three kilometers behind the section you intend to hit. But sometimes you can't because there's an enemy bridge or artillery position with heavy flak in that area and you have to come in closer because you don't want those flak bursts alerting every enemy fighter in a 10 kilometer radius to your presence. Just be aware that the closer your attack point, the steeper your attack dive is going to be and all the other corresponding problems like a steeper dive angle and less time to get lined up properly. Now before we cover this section, I want to tell you the second and final cardinal rule. Always use a one second bomb timer, and this is why. If you go with a contact timer, your aircraft is going to get shredded by your own bombs, and there's a good chance your pilot will get smoked too, like this guy. On the other hand, if you go with a bomb timer longer than one second, most of the bombs are likely to bounce away from the column and explode too far away to do any damage. Now I have noticed that on some maps the bombs will stick into place at the point they impact the ground, but on others they bounce and continue moving. I've paid attention over the years for some kind of indicator to predict whether the bombs will stick or bounce on a given map, but the most consistent factor I can identify to you is that the steeper your dive angle at bomb release, the higher the possibility of your bombs sticking into the point of impact, and the shallower the dive angle, the greater the chance of them bouncing. So I play it smart with a one second timer, knowing the bombs are either going to stick or hit the road, bounce forward about 10 or 15 meters and explode within the vehicle area. Now, you may be concerned that a one second timer is not sufficient time for your aircraft to clear the target area prior to bomb detonation. And I can tell you with the certainty of personal experience that if you release bombs at a speed of 550 kilometers per hour or faster, you will easily escape the blast of bombs up to 500 kilograms on a one second timer. In fact, I routinely drop SC-500s on a one second timer from a BF-110 at speeds between 400 and 500 kilometers per hour without any blast damage issues. Now, there are four important components of this tank attack technique that are affected by dive angle. Accuracy, bomb spread, bomb dispersion pattern, and dive recovery. Generally speaking, accuracy is easier the more shallow the dive angle, because you are attacking a linear horizontal target area, and a shallow dive presents the column at a more horizontal angle to the front, as opposed to a more vertical angle when coming in from a steep dive. And since you're not diving steeply, you can drop lower and closer to the targets because you won't need as much room for dive recovery. But that is only part of the story. The steeper the dive angle, the tighter the bomb spread, at least initially, and dive recovery has a huge effect on bomb dispersion pattern. You see, a downward nose angle keeps the bomb moving forward after it bounces, but a bomb dropped from an aircraft with a zero degree nose angle perpendicular to the ground is going to bounce all over the place, mostly away from the target area, and even a one second timer can't prevent that. Now you might get lucky and all your bombs will stick in place regardless of your nose angle or bomb timer, but personally, I'm not going to take any chances. And you might ask, what situation would cause a pilot to release bombs from 
from a flat flight trajectory? And the answer is easy, because he ran out of vertical dive space and had to begin dive recovery while the bombs are still being dropped. To prevent this situation, you have to take into account how many bombs you're dropping and the delay setting between bombs. This chart from the handbook shows how long you need to stay lined up with the column and maintain a downward nose angle as the bombs are being released. If you hit the bomb release button too late into the attack dive, you're going to find yourself having to pull up to recover from your dive while the bombs are still coming out. So the takeaway from this is, the longer the time to get all the bombs out, the higher you're going to have to start the drop to ensure a downward nose angle throughout the bomb release. And on a related topic, let's talk about bomb arming. German bombs arm very quickly after release, and you can come down super low in a JU-88 and chances are good they're all going to explode. But if you try that in a PE-2 or A-20B, you're going to find out they won't explode because they didn't have time to arm. When I first started flying red ground attack aircraft, I found this out the hard way many times when the first half of my bombs would explode and the latter half wouldn't because at the end of the dive, I had gotten too low. So the harsh reality is when you're flying these red aircraft, you have to drop higher than you would if you're flying the JU-88. And the higher you drop, the harder it is to be accurate. Like any technique in IL-2, it just takes practice. Wind is not your friend, and wind will fuck you over a lot if you don't assess it and take steps to address it. Always check the wind speed and angle on the server map page and your bombsite info panel for specific wind data for different altitudes. Check the direction of your attack dive using the IL-2 mission planner, and verify the direction the wind will be pushing against your attack dive direction. The most important information is the wind speed and direction at ground level, but be aware of the wind data between your attack dive altitude and bomb release altitude, as it will be pushing you during the attack dive. In my experience, wind speeds of 2 meters per second or higher coming from any angle above 20 degrees to 90 degrees will exert an effect on bomb accuracy. Obviously, the higher the wind speed and the closer it is to a 90 degree angle, the more effect it's going to have. And what you have to do to counter the wind is offset your bomb release heading against the wind. But the $50,000 question is, offset by how much? Now I've spent quite a bit of time trying to come up with some concrete answers on how far to offset based on specific wind speed and angles. And what I've found is that there are so many possibilities it's very difficult to predict a guaranteed offset distance that will put your bombs within the column every time. One approach you can take is to record your first attack and then look at the footage to assess where your offset should be based on the results of that first attack. Some might call this cheating, but I would counter that your rear gunners would easily give you an accurate battle damage assessment and how far to the sides your bombs exploded. But of course, the AI technology currently prevents that degree of assistance. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples from the TAW server where I use the flight recordings to ascertain the correct offset instead of going right back like a dumbass and getting the same result. In this first example, the section of the tank column I intend to hit is aligned on a 342 degree heading with a 162 degree back azimuth and the wind push at ground level is coming from 125 degrees at 3 meters per second. So we have a 37 degree crosswind coming from the right at 3 meters per second, which means the offset should be upwind to the right. Well, as you can see on this first attack run, I'm offsetting to the right almost all the way down to bomb release altitude, but at the last minute, I let the wind push me over to the left. Now, if this is what I saw coming off bomb release in a no-win situation, I'd be thinking, shit, that looks like a good one. But even with a moderate 3-meter wind pushing from 37 degrees, it totally fucked up that run. And I might have gotten a couple of trucks and a flak, but that wasn't even close enough to score a tank. And after reviewing this footage, I saw that a sight picture directly above the road will put the bombs this far to the left. So I need to offset to the right by this much. And I need to maintain that offset and not let the wind push me left at the last minute. So I go back to the column, and because I'm staying in communication with my fellow players, I know that in the meantime, the column has been hit by a couple of teammates inside that wooded area I hit before. So I'm looking to hit it somewhere at the back where it hasn't been touched. Notice how I start the attack dive offset well upwind to the right. And as I get closer to my intended to target section, I'm gradually moving left, but in a controlled manner and not letting the wind get the best of me. And based on the data from the previous attack run, I release bombs here. Even though the wind pushes me to the left a little more than I want, that offset puts all the bombs within the column. Now in this second example, I intend to hit the lead tanks at the front of the column, and it's kind of hard to see here on the IL-2 mission planner, but that section is aligned on a 212 degree azimuth with a 5 meter wind from 260 degrees. So in this example, we're dealing with a 5 meter crosswind from 48 degrees. And on the first attack run, you can see I'm offset a little to the right, and bomb release finishes right over the road, and again, in a no-win situation, this will look pretty good. But with a 5 meter wind from 48 degrees, the bombs end up hitting here to the left. So after looking at the footage, I know where I need to be at bomb release and I go back to hit the same section. 
This time, I keep my attack dive offset to the right, release bombs off to the right, and even though I hope to get all three tanks with the .05 bomb delay, the blast line is only long enough to get the first two. Now I'm not going to lie, my impression coming off the target was that my offset wasn't far enough to the right and my bombs were going to be slightly left of the tanks, but in fact, the bombs were slightly right of the tanks, and that underscores an important lesson. It is often problematic to determine the correct offset, even when you have all the required information. But the basic takeaways are this. Start the attack dive offset into the wind. Gradually move the aircraft toward the column carefully and in a controlled manner. And remember, the wind is already pushing you that direction, and too much movement too soon will put you downwind. It may feel counterintuitive to aim at an area to the side of the targeted section, but that is the only way to achieve accuracy when there is a significant crosswind. Now that's a lot of work with a significant potential for failure even when you have all the information needed to get it right. In situations where the wind speed is 0 or 1 meter per second and the wind angle is 20 degrees or less, you don't have to deal with any of this, just line up on the column. But in my experience, it seems like at least 80% of the time in multiplayer that's not the case and I have to put to work the principles outlined in this section to ensure any chance of bombing accuracy with this technique. So another option to consider when facing a strong crosswind is just take the bigger bombs, which might with a little luck, get you a tank or two even if your accuracy is slightly off. This option is more relevant to the JU-88 because it can carry four SC-500s. Since the PE-2 can only carry two FAB-500s and the A-20B can only carry four FAB-250s, it's a judgment call on the pilot's part, taking into account all risk factors in the current server environment. I can pretty much boil post-dive actions down to one phrase. Dance like a motherfucker, and you better be stepping fancy if there's four or five AAA shooting at you. The best technique is to stay low to the ground, use the trees for cover, and don't stop evading until you're sure you're out of AAA range. And if you hit the column from the rear, you are probably headed in the direction of friendly lines already. The standard loadout for this technique with the JU-88 is 28 SC-50s. There is a loadout option for 44 SC-50s, and it would be awesome to have 44 centerline bombs in the bomb bay, but those extra 16 bombs are out on the wings. And unlike the 28 belly bombs, these extra bombs cannot be dropped individually. The underwing single option actually releases them in groups of four, and it requires quite a bit of time to get all 44 bombs out while maintaining a downward nose angle. The extra 800 kilos of weight makes takeoff more difficult and slows down crews and climbs speed a lot, so I personally never use this option. If I'm taking extra bombs, I go with the four SC-250s, but it comes down to personal preference. You have the choice of a .05 bomb delay for a dense blast area or a .1 setting for a longer but more spread out blast area, and I have to admit that between the three aircraft covered in this video, this is my favorite aircraft for this bombing technique because of the 28 SC-50 bomb loadout. Even though the bombs are relatively small, there are so many of them that even a .1 delay creates a fairly dense blast area. If the 88 was hitting German columns, it would rip up those panzers like nobody's business, but T-34s and KV-1s are much tougher opponents, and you have to put that bomb stream down right on top of them to guarantee destruction. Now at around 580 kph into the attack dive, the controls stiffen, and you can't yank it around to get lined up. It's kind of like driving a semi on a frozen lake, and you got to be thinking two or three moves in advance. But on the plus side, it holds dive stability very well, and stays where you put it. Now every time a major patch comes out the past couple of years, the amount of nose trim required to keep the nose down during the attack dive changes. So I'm not going to give you specific nose trim magic numbers because it's just going to change a few months after this video comes out. I will say that as of September 2019, it does pretty well at default nose trim, but that wasn't the case between September 2017 and September 2019. If you're not sure, just do a quick mission, dive toward a road from 2,000 to 2,500 meters, and find the nose trim setting that keeps the aircraft from going tail heavy during the dive, but also allows you to recover from the attack dive efficiently without eating the trees. The most effective loadout in the PE-2 for this technique is the 10 FAB-100 option, and that is significantly less bomb weight than the JU-88 and A-20 bomb capacities. You might think, compared to the SC-50s, that twice the bomb size employed against the weaker Axis tanks would be a surefire tank killer, but in my experience that has not been the case much of the time because it's only 10 bombs and the other problem is the choice of bomb delay. The .1 option makes for a far too short blast line, and the .25 option creates a bomb dispersion pattern 
with pretty wide gaps between the bombs. Ideally, a .175 would be the best delay, but that's not possible, so you're stuck with either too short or too wide delay options. In a .25 delay, we'll have big gaps in blast coverage if you come in using a shallow attack dive. The only method to mitigate this problem somewhat is to steepen your attack dive, which will tighten up the spacing between bombs. The PE-2 is very responsive to stick input, which is great when you're evading flak or enemy fighters, but not so great when you're trying to hold a straight line up on a tank column. And the issue is roll. This aircraft will roll on you like a dog with fleas, especially when there's a crosswind. So what works for me is to make some pretty extreme key mapping adjustments before I hit a tank column in this aircraft. You can experiment with different settings to find out what works best for you. I don't do this for any other aircraft, and for all I know, it may have something to do with my joystick. But this works for me in cutting down on unwanted roll during the attack dive. So far, default nose trim works fine for most attack dives, but if you're coming in at a steep angle, you might want to go a little tail-heavy nose trim to ensure a successful dive recovery. The A-20B is more effective than the PE-2 as a tank killer, and sometimes even better than the JU-88 under certain conditions. It offers loadout options for 16 or 20 FAB-100s. When you take the extra four bombs, they're not in the belly, they're out on the wings, so you're not going to get that nice linear pattern you get with the belly bombs. If your lineup is not perfectly straight, you may end up putting two of them on the road, however. They do slow you down a lot, so it's a judgment call on whether to take them. But even with 16 belly bombs, the thing's a monster. That's 60% more bomb weight than the PE-2 bomb capacity and volume has consequences in the tank killing department. You can go with a .1 bomb delay for a dense blast area with a blast zone of respectable length or take your chances with a .25 delay for a very wide blast area covering a much longer section of the column. Just be aware that the .25 bomb delay presents the same bomb spacing issues I highlighted with the PE-2 and since you're carrying 16 or 20 bombs instead of 10 at a .25 bomb delay you're going to have to start your bomb drop much higher to get them all out before dive recovery. The A-20B doesn't stiffen as bad as the JU-88 during the attack dive, and it doesn't have roll issues as bad as the PE-2. It does have a single dot in the gun sight reticle instead of crosshairs, so you kind of got to channel a vertica stadia line when you're lining up. The main weakness of the A-20B concerning this technique is its low G-limit. You just can't jerk this aircraft around like a JU-88 or a PE-2. It will snap a wing if you push it, so ease it gently out of the dive and don't make excessively harsh evasive maneuvers. The JU-88 and the A-20B have options for augmented bomb loadouts, but in the case of the A-20B, it's not so much augmented, but swapping out FAB-100s for FAB-250s. And the fact is, the total weight of this loadout is less than 20 FAB-100s. Now, there are three augmented bomb loadouts for the JU-88, four if you count the 44 SC-50 loadout. And which one you choose is dependent on the mission, pilot preference, and pilot skill. Just know that if you go with the four SC-500s, you're going to lose 10 SC-50s. These are very heavy loadouts, so make sure you're schooled up on how to get the aircraft off the ground with all that extra weight, and the longer the runway and the colder the ambient temperature, the easier it is. The second issue is you're going to be climbing much, much slower, so if getting to the target quickly is a priority, you might not want to take so much weight. Regardless, there are many possibilities for how to serve up an augmented bomb load on enemy tanks. I categorized the possible approach options into four categories, single pass, double pass, multiple target areas, and finally multiple pass options, which is an entire topic in itself and will be covered in an upcoming video with these medium bombers and other types of attacker aircraft. The single pass approach is simply dumping the entire bomb load in one pass. Just be aware of the high probability that you'll be dropping those last bombs at a flat nose angle along with the associated possible problems we've covered already. The double pass approach is to make two separate attack dives, and it's up to you whether to drop the externals or the internals on the first pass. I drop the heaviest bomb load first, so it will be easier to climb back up to attack dive altitude for the second pass. The main drawback to this variant is that if there is active flak still in the column after the first pass, unless you have a designated flak dragger, you have to climb back up to a high enough altitude to get the dive speed on the second attack dive to keep the AAA from hitting you on the way in. Hopefully, you can get most of that altitude back coming out of that first attack dive. This two-pass approach keeps you in the target area in enemy territory much longer than a single pass, and I recommend doing this with fighter escort, or at least in situations where the chance of enemy fighters showing up is low. The multiple target area approach works when there is another target area like a bridge, defensive position, or artillery position in proximity to the tank column. You hit that target area first with the big bombs, then hit the tank column with the belly bombs. You can level bomb that first target if you want to retain your altitude or do an 
attack dive on it and climb back up to attack dive altitude prior to reaching your second attack point on the tank column. This approach does take some smart planning. You have to take into account the light and heavy flat capabilities of both target areas and you don't want to hit target areas that are so close together that the AAA from both will be firing at you or your group simultaneously. And again, this is much safer with fighter escort because of the extended time in enemy territory. Well, all right, I hope this video enhanced some of the points made in subsection 7.2 of the Ground Attacker Handbook, and I wish you much success in making it work for you. If you want to see additional footage of this technique in action, please look at any of the TAW videos on my YouTube page. I have more videos in the pipeline that will expand on many of the concepts presented in the handbook, so if you're interested in ground attack techniques, please subscribe. This is HVB. Peace out.